Welcome to Nothing Is Real, a podcast about the Beatles. Everybody thinks they know the Beatles, but how much do we really know? My name is Jason Carty. My name is Stephen Cockcroft. And we are live on tape from Dublin and Belfast. This is the third part of our never-ending look at Rubber Soul. I think we're spending more time on Rubber Soul than the Beatles spent on Rubber Soul, I Stephen. I think we probably are. I'm going slightly star crazy. <laughs> no, we're totally, we're totally fine. And uh, you can't get enough Rubber Soul. When we left the story uh, at the end of part two, uh, we were right up until uh, Monday, November the 8th. And uh, the album is due in about 10 days time uh, to be uh, pressed at the pressing plant because it's due to be in the shops on December the 3rd. So just over um, three and a bit weeks into the future. But a chunk of it still doesn't exist. Uh, as we w- when we left our heroes, they were re-recording I'm Looking Through You and doing 12 Bar Blues originals, which is not what the Beatles were meant to be doing. No. Um, and there's still other obligations that they have t- to do. So when we get to Monday, November the 8th, this is a day uh, spent doing uh, their Christmas record and they're doing think for yourself and there's also some general generic Beatles chat getting recorded yes because in addition to recording an album doing a TV special preparing a single they've got a Christmas record to do (laughs) as well uh, for the fans they do don't the fans have enough you know you know, if you if you look at Lewison's um, Abbey Road Sessions book, it talks about this Beatles uh, speech, speech thing being recorded as yeah gen- general background noise, and it gets labelled as you know, do not throw this away. This gets need to this will be used at some point in the future. Uh, this will eventually be issued, is what was written on the box, not for the Christmas flexi disc, but it does get used eventually, doesn't it? Yes, it turns up in Yellow Submarine or a little snippet of them practicing harmonies, uh, which I I, yeah. I think I the first time I saw Yellow Submarine, I managed to get all the way through the film without noticing that. Well, the first time I watched Yellow Submarine, I had I'd read Lewison's book in advance. So I'm like, uh, where's the snippet of harmonies? And I was waiting for the snippet of harmonies. And when you hear it, it's when they're in Pepperland and they're, they're kind of doing a little quick rehearsal. That, that's where you get the there's a little tiny. It's only about one or two seconds yeah. snippet of think for yourself harmony. So it is blink and you'll miss it. But it's the only uh, original uh, Beatle voices that are actually in the cartoon uh, is that little snippet of of think for yourself uh, which which comes from this tape of general chit chat that was recorded but it's enough to get think for yourself onto the yellow submarine song track yes <laughs> which it does make the point purely because that one to two seconds of of uh, you know recording george obviously you know said hey put my song on there you you you, you ne'er do else where are my royalties for this uh ab- absolutely so uh this is a session that again is uh they are now normalizing the the sessions that go past midnight and this is a session that starts at about 9 p.m and goes on to about 3 a.m and so they're rehearsing the song which is where the snippet for think to yourself comes from before they go on to actually recording it so it's George again um contributing a second song a second great George song so he's really um I think uh, I think his contributions to Rubber Soul are possibly my favorite tracks on the album there I've said it I'm really undoing my team Paul credentials when I come to looking at Rubber Soul I'm I'm defending Michelle you're saying these are the best contributions I mean, it's, it's it's people are going We're to be so the con- looking glass people we are people are going to be so confused <laughs> Um, and because they've rehearsed it, they managed to get a basic track for Think For Yourself done in one take, bass guitar, drums, Harrison playing the Strat again, John is on the Continental, uh, Vox Continental organ, um, and then they record a number of, number of overdubs, including Harrison triple tracking his vocals and doing lots of harmony and and uh, percussion, but there's also a, a, a new sound on the song, isn't there? Yeah, this is, uh, Paul's got a fuzz box, and he knows how to use it. And he's He's going to use He's it. He's going yeah, to yeah. use it. Yeah. So jo- George talks about this. He says, uh, when Phil Spector was making zippity doodah, the engineer who set up the track overloaded the microphone on the guitar part and became very distorted. And Phil Spector said, leave it like that. It's great. And then some years later, everyone started to try and copy the sound and they invented the fuzz box. We had one and tried the bass through it and it sounded really good. Um, so yeah, this is a very distinctive bass part. Um, and, and what I, what I'd say is Paul's bass playing on this album is very good. And I, as you've alluded to before, mm-hmm. he's moving to this idea where you record the bass part separately and then you can kind of do interesting things 
yeah. with it. But this this is one of um, the, the, when it was being recorded. Uh, the song is called "Won't Be There with You," and uh, by the time it's finished, it's called "Think for Yourself." And uh, you think this is one of George's pointy finger songs and uh, he was asked about this and in 1980 he said well it must be about somebody from the sound of it but all this time later I don't quite recall who inspired that tune probably the government probably you know it's certainly um, you know think for yourself is a very George type statement you know um, but it's it, it's also a general statement I would think of the Beatles you know the kind of the individualism that the yeah, the, the 60s and the Beatles were kind of part of uh, cultivating, you know, think for yourself is a is a very straightforward message, you know. It is. And again, it's this idea. It's not a straightforward love song by any stretch. So uh, they're, they're just, yeah. as the sessions progress, they're moving away from that. Um, so the, the vocals are double tracked. And so in the stereo versions, there's uh even in the original stereo and in george martin's 1980s stereo remix the the the, the double track vocals are panned left and right yeah. but again the yellow submarine song track um comes up trumps because this again is a full stereo remix and the vocals have a nice center double tracking kind of effect in that so uh, we'll say it again folks pick up the yellow submarine song track if you haven't already um the main guts of think for yourself happen between 9 p.m to 2 a.m um but they still spend an hour then at the end of the day because we mentioned uh in an earlier part this is obviously part 100 uh, about how the original christmas recording for the fan club record got thrown in the bin uh, tony barrow's um uh, script wasn't really with the time so they spend another hour basically improvising or extemporizing uh the beatles christmas fan club record for 1965 don't they Yes. Uh, so again, you you think the 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 work rate here, the number of things that they're trying to juggle at the one time are just ludicrous. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, but yeah, so they get the, they they get this year's uh, Christmas record uh, down at, at the same time. Just just give, just give it the one hour. That's all it needs, you know. Um, so that's that's a, a decent day's work on a song of George's. Uh, Tuesday, November the 9th is a mixing session day. So the Beatles are not present. It's George Martin and normal Norman Two Decibels Smith are there creating mono mixes of Michelle. What goes on? Run for your life. Think for yourself and the Christmas record. And then they do some stereo mixes of Think for Yourself, Michelle and what goes on. Um, which brings us to the following day, which is Wednesday, November the 10th. And this is uh, session 14. Uh, there's also some mixing done this day as well, because they really are running out of time. And the song that they record on Wednesday, November the 10th, um, uh, uh, which which they do after the, the, the mixing session, is I think one of the most significant Beatles songs, and perhaps one of the more unheralded Beatles songs, which is The Word. The Word. Do you like this song? I see every time I, we go into this and I, I just keep waiting for you to say, and this song, I really hate this song. I love this song. Thank heavens for that. We're into part three <laughs> and we find a song that you like. I, I love the word and I think it's a fantastic song. And I think it is uh, generally a, a roadmap to what they are about to do next and what they are about to sing about next and what they are going to communicate about yeah. next. Barry Miles in, in many years from now says this is one of the first hippie anthems uh, for the rest of the 60s and until this day, the word was and is love. And um, yeah. Paul, Paul talks about the song uh, sort of contemporaneously and uh, he focuses more on the sound rather than the lyric. And he says to write a good song with just one note in it, like Long Tong Sally, is really very hard. It's the kind of thing we've wanted to do for some time. We get near it in the word. So he's focusing on the sound, which is quite innovative, you know, rather than the, the, the lyric. Uh, John in 1980 says, you read the words, it's all about getting smart. It's the marijuana period. It's love. It's a love and peace thing. The word is love, right? Uh, Rubber Soul was the first one where we were fully fledged potheads. So again, it's not they're they're not identifying the sort of idealism there, but they're just recognizing that things are changing. Well, yeah, and th there's a quote here from George where he says, uh, "George Harrison, it's it sort of dawned on me that love was the answer when I was younger." on the Rubber Soul album. You know, my first expression was the song called "The Word." The word is love, uh, and in the good and bad books that I've read, whatever wherever the word is love it's an underlying theme to the universe and it it kind of is a a realization or an unlocking of you know what they 
follow on to do. You know, there's a direct line yeah. between this song and All You Need Is Love to the Summer of Love to going to the Maharishi to the messages that the Maharishi preach. Um, I think all of that comes from, um, you know, comes from this song. And you, you see it occasionally in, in different acts where, you know, when you look at their catalogue in retrospect, there's sometimes a song that signposts what's going to happen. Um, one of my favorite examples is the Pink Floyd song Free Ford. You know that one? Yes, yes. Which, uh, 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 which is from 1972. And that's kind of the first Pink Floyd song that references the war and the pressures of fame and all this kind of stuff. And you're like, oh, they're going to write a couple of albums about that next. Uh, but you only kind of realize that in retrospect. And the word is one of those songs where, you oh. know, this is this is where they're where they're going to go. And it sounds great. It does have a great sound. It does have a great sound. Well, that's good. I'm glad you went with Pink Floyd. I thought we were going to get a U2 uh, reference there. So this is... Th well... <laughs> this is this is sort of moving swiftly, swiftly, swiftly along. Uh, John does say that this is a, a joint effort. Um, he said mm -hmm. in t 1980, he said, the word was written together. It was mainly mine. Probably written in October and November. So they're, they're literally writing these and recording them. Um, and uh, the other little side note about this song is... Yoko visits Paul in 1966. So we sometimes lose sight of the fact that, that the first Beatles that she has contact with is Paul mm -hmm. asking for a song manuscript to give as a birthday present to uh, John Cage. And uh, Paul declines this, but Paul sends her to uh, John and uh, he gives her a sort of lyric sheet for the word that he's sort of scribbled little drawings on. So that the, the song kind of has a little bit of a uh, 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 another mm. connection there. Uh, yeah, it is it, very much, you know, a song I think that they couldn't have written a year before. It, no. it is influenced by the ideas that they're getting and the things that they're ingesting. Um, it's recorded uh, across seven hours, 9 p.m. to 4 a.m. There's another one of those midnight straddling sessions. And, uh, you know, it's completed in three takes. Paul is on the grand piano, Ringo on drums. John is uh, playing a Fender Stratocaster. And then there's overdubs from Lennon's vocals and backing vocals from Paul and George. Um, uh, and then there's, again, a bass guitar added in at the last minute, this yeah. similar pattern arising from, from Paul, which is very, very interesting. Um, the, so I, 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 I certainly think that's a great song. We then move on to, uh, unbelievably, you know, uh, once they're finished at 4 a.m., they decide to take another swipe, yet another swipe through I'm Looking Through You, which is the song that will not die. That will not be recorded. I mean, <laughs> this is this is how much time do they need? This is unprecedented, really. <laughs> yeah. So they start the song on the 24th of October and they don't finish it until the 11th of November. I mean, th this this would become more par for the course. But this is this is really odd that Paul is just working and reworking and I don't like this and we've got you know John did this a little bit with Norwegian Wood but Paul is really not letting this go he clearly hears something in his head um, and wants to get there I like the anthology version I think that that, that that's probably my favorite version so um, yeah but it's this idea that they're now working on into the early hours of the morning this is now just becoming the new normal yeah but it, it you know when you look at rubber soul there actually isn't a lot of Paul on Rubber Soul. Like there's really only four hardcore kind of Paul songs you could say, which is, you know, Drive My Car, You Won't See Me, uh, Michelle, uh, and then I'm Looking Through You, you know? There, you know, you have the, you have the Ringo song, you know, What Goes On, you have the two George songs. Um, and then John kind of is very mm. dominant on this album still with all his different tracks. You know, when you look at, you look at John's list of songs, well, you've got Norwegian Wood, you've got Nowhere Man, you've got The Word, um, you have Girl, you know, uh, you've In My Life, uh, just looking at the list here, you've got uh, Wait and Run For Your Life. So John is totally trouncing Paul on this album. So Paul is just, is he remaking the song because he just doesn't have any other songs to, to go at that point in time? Well, he, he seems to have, I mean, Paul, does seem at this point to be collaborating with John. So, you, you know, the songs, the song, a, a lot of the songs that you're earmarking as, as John songs, Paul is putting a lot of effort into those. So they, they may start, that with is John, true. They, they may start uh, as John with, you know, having a first verse or having a basic idea. Um, but, but Paul seems to be putting a lot of effort into refining the raw material that, that John is, uh, is, is coming up with. So, it's maybe slightly misleading, but but yes, you're right. This is this is clearly a song that 
he wants to get right. And I don't know whether it's, it's is it a song that means something in particular to him? Is mm. it, it has a particular kind of resonance? So if you think about, you know, this is clearly we think about Jane Asher, this this song. Yeah. And um, John certainly says this in 1980. He just says, Paul wrote that one. He must have had an argument with Jane Asher. And, um, <laughs> well, well, she's away, isn't she? That's part yes, of the argument at the time. This she's the in thing. Bristol. She's in Bristol. So Paul, in speaking to Hunter Davis, says, you know, that there were arguments between the two of them may have led to Jane leaving for Bristol. So she's off working. But um, the, he seems to think, well, maybe because we're arguing all the time, this is what prompted her to take this job. So he says, I knew I was selfish. It caused a few rows. Jane went off and I said, OK, then leave. I'll find someone else. It was shattering to be without her. That was when I wrote, I'm looking through you. I think it's totally my song. I don't remember any of John's assistance. So perhaps it's that he, he wants to get this right because he's kind of addressing a very personal issue. Possibly. I mean, what they do on that November the 10th night is they give it two hours at the end of recording the word and they eventually manage to get down a, a, a rhythm track um, where John's on acoustic guitar, Paul on bass, Ringo on drums and, and maybe uh, George on um, a tambourine because that's being played in the background as well. At that point, it's after 4 a.m. in the morning and they 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 call it a, a, a night. Um, you know, uh, they what happens next on the following day, uh, November the 11th, which is the 15th um, session uh, for Rubber Soul, is basically one of these marathon sessions, which is, you know, occasionally the Beatles have these uh, incredibly productive days in the studio where they, they get an awful lot of work done. And if you look at Thursday, November the 11th, there's a, a sixth uh, mixing session. So George Martin is in first before everyone else, and he's doing some, uh, you know, mono and stereo mixes of, of the word. Um, but then uh, they go into recording and they, they work on uh, You Won't See Me, Girl, Wait, and I'm Looking Through You. They have these four songs because this is it. They're, their backs are against the wall and they have to, um, they have to get the album done. So they do four songs in a day or they finish four songs in a day uh, and they start at 6 p.m. in the evening. And so the first thing that they uh, get to work on is You Won't See Me. Now, that's a great song. That is a great song. Um, why do they wait? And, why, why don't they come in at nine o'clock in the morning? <laughs> well, they'd only finished at about 4 a.m. the previous morning. Yeah. But they could have they could have come in at about two. You know, yes. that's not totally unimaginable. You know, guys, could you? So lazy. So lazy. <laughs> well, they also have to come in from you know different parts of the city and everything else. Um, but uh, you won't see me is another one of these um, all relationship songs. Maybe we should be glad that there was a little bit of dysfunction because we got some great songs out of it at the end of '65. We did, we did. Barry Miles says in in many years from now, in October '65, Jane had joined the Bristol Old Vic and was deeply involved in her career as an actress. She spent most of her time in Bristol. The majority of Jane's friends were in the theatre. She did not take drugs, and she clearly felt increasingly alienated from Paul's drug taking friends. Uh, the relationship hung on in part because they were apart so often. If Jane was in a play, Paul wouldn't see much of her unless he attended a performance. They really only saw each other properly on special occasions like holidays. So he's never, Paul has never said it, but it's commonly assumed mm. this is about the tensions in, in the relationship and Jane supposed unavailability to take phone call. Um, so yeah, it's that little bit of tension that creates the art. Yeah, well, yeah, and and this, and I'm looking through you. You know, they both seem very um, real and genuine in a way that Michelle doesn't. When I was complaining about Michelle earlier on, uh, you know, the, this is a, you know, this certainly does feel very, very real. Um, and so, you know, they spend about five hours from about six p.m. to eleven p.m trying to get you won't see me down and remember this is the absolute last day deadline that they have uh, if they want to get an album in the shops for christmas for december the the third so in the five hours that they spend with you won't see me like most songs they they start trying to do a complete uh, rhythm track to to start with and then there's a number of overdubs mainly paul's vocals doing his strategic harmonies uh, and again an overdub bass part that has been the recurring theme in rubber soul is that there's a recurring uh theme of basses being put on last uh, and then we have everyone's favorite fifth beetle mal evans he's on yes, the track he's on the track so he gets to play an anvil with a hammer 
That is not what he is playing. He is not. He wasn't sent out to get an anvil. He was sent out to get a Hammond organ. I see. Uh, and what is it? Um, and, 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 and does he play a very complicated solo part or what does he play? He he basically plays a single note A just throughout the whole thing, and uh, could, it's not sp- it's we not could... sped up or slowed. Yeah, yeah. Where were you? They were looking for you. You and weren't gets, answering the phone. And he gets a credit. He gets a credit uh, <laughs> on the back on on the rear I, sleeve. I feel this is a credit of love and maybe mild sarcasm. I don't know. It's it's it's. I think they'd be quite happy to. They just love Mal. You I know. Think so. so we've we learned all, anything this year. Mal. It's that yeah. Mal is mal is a a lovely uh person and um the other thing i love about this song is john and george have their harmonies their ooh la la's as well yeah can i tell you that's the thing i don't like about this uh okay why don't you like that it's too uh straightforward well no because it's right placed right beside uh nowhere man which is exactly the same it's exactly the same that's a terrible piece of sequencing um Mm. because you've got those two really similar background vocal arrangements it's not that i don't like them i don't dislike them for themselves i just dislike uh dislike them for where they're placed on the album and uh, the other the fun fact this is the longest song the beatles had recorded up to this point at three minutes 22 or three minutes 25 if you've only got one a year <laughs> yeah the mono version's a little bit longer yeah i think uh, if memory serves ticket to ride is the first beatles song to go past Mm. three minutes uh, and now you have got this which is an extraordinary long three minutes and 25 seconds it doesn't uh, doesn't feel like it there's uh there's a, a, a number of things you can notice on the mix i think we all noticed the cough i noticed the cough yes yeah. um so just before paul starts singing when i call you up there's a, a faint cough in the background and even when george martin remixed this in the 80s he left the cough there and uh it's still present in the 2009 version so that hasn't been giles martin out of existence i approve of the cough still being there i like the fact that <laughs> you know these these little kind of glitches i don't approve of fixing things 50 years old yeah <laughs> um so that's um that's once that song is in the can once you won't see me is in the can we then move on to john lennon's girl and Considering we're at the end of the sessions, mm. to pull out a song as striking as Girl and to, to, to record it as quickly, but it really is a song that is very different from anything they've recorded before. And we've talked about how on Rubber Soul, John is trying on an Elvis hat or a Bob Dylan hat, but Girl is very much its own song. Yes, I think Girl is, he's, he's kind of, you know, he's wearing his own hat. This is, this is very much a Lennon style song or what will become mm. his style and he he talks about this quite a lot so uh in 1970 he said girl is real there's no such thing as the girl she was a dream but the words are all right it wasn't just a song it was about that girl that turned out to be yoko in the end the one that a lot of us were looking for i always had this dream of this particular woman coming into my life i knew it wouldn't be someone buying beetle records i was hoping for a woman who could give me what i get from a man intellectually i wanted someone i could be myself with so i mean clearly in 1970 he's everything's about yoko he's kind of justifying this after the fact but it's an interesting take just 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 to rewind that quote uh i wanted a woman who could give me what i get from a man intellectually that's a bit of a what's the word poor thing to say, a bit of a poor thing <laughs> it's to say. very dismissive of a lot of uh i i i i think i think it's a, a potentially misguided because i think there's a lot of men at the time who weren't giving him what he needed intellectually as well i think so but i think you you, you if you if you break that down he says mm-hmm. at the start of that quote i knew it wouldn't be someone buying beatles records so he's kind of yeah. saying well i knew it wasn't going to be a screaming fan you know these these kind of teenage girls that scream and have this idea or want to get at the Beatles or want to get you know that he's been quite dismissive of the fans uh so that's one point and the other point is where he says I was hoping for a woman who could give me what I want from a man intellectually I think when he talks about a man I think he's probably talking about Paul yes I, I I think I think what he's probably realizing is that you know if his if his male relationships are you know, not sexual relationships, unlike, you know, his female relationships, because yeah. he's been a pop star for the last two or three years, that uh, I guess that's what he's trying to, that's the statement he's trying to make, is that he can he can have somebody he can 
have a conversation with basically yeah i mean i think i think you, i'd say if you put it all in context a, a lot of these interviews at this time are just about justifying he feels the need to justify his relationship with yoko i mean that's that's a, a given from sort of 68 on um you know after that initial literal honeymoon period with the press uh he's always having to to justify that and in 1970 she's getting the blame for breaking up the beatles etc 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 so he has to do that and he has to distinguish yoko from the other women that he's had relationships with in the past who are just kind of uh you know casual affairs and etc uh, etc et but i genuinely think where he says i was hoping for a woman who could give me what i get from paul intellectually mm. i think i think that's the way i would i would read that rather than a kind of generally dismissive you know men are better than 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 women yeah that that that's fair enough i mean john does say later on in 1980 he does say that the song woman is like a sequel to girl yeah. that yeah. once he's embedded in his relationship with yoko and once he has a bit of hindsight that woman is the the song for yoko where girl is kind of the longing song it's interesting yes. to see them as two yeah. sides of, of of one story um they are part of the, again, this is another one of these songs where, you know, John had lyrics and Paul is co-writing. So you're right to say that there's a lot of very specific Paul co-writes going on here. Some of the uh, the language in the song is quite um, adult for, you know, the I want to hold your hand hit makers. You know, what she thought when she was young, that pain would lead to pleasure, you know, all that kind of stuff. A man must break his back, all this kind of language. That's not classic Beatles language. No, it, it, it is a kind of philosophical or religious aspect. And we, we know that in and around this period, John is kind of reading voraciously uh, on matters of philosophy and religion and, and, and uh, those sorts of issues. And it's, it's, it's uh, you know, he talks about this. He says, I was talking about Christianity and that you have to be tortured to attain heaven. That was the Catholic Christian concept, be tortured and it'll be all right, which seems to be true. But not their concept of it. I didn't believe in that, that you have to be tortured to attain anything. It just so happens that you are. So he's, he's, yeah, this is a much more adult approach to relationships. Mm. And it's a much more considered approach. And he's, he's sort of looking at the dynamics of a relationship rather than just the, I love you, you love me. Oh, how happy we will be there. I've just written a song. Um, but you know he's 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 <laughs> looking he's looking at the uh write that down mal uh he, <laughs> he's looking james is at the door he's looking at the um <laughs> he's looking at the dynamic of a relationship in a very grown-up a very adult way yeah yeah um they start recording the song at 11 p.m on this very busy night november the 11th and it certainly has an 11 p.m feel the song does have a good feel um john is on acoustic guitar with a cap on the neck, Paul is on bass guitar, uh, Ringo's on drums, uh, no vocals are done. Uh, then John puts his vocals on first and, and John, you know, the, the, the vocals are very striking for the, the kind of breathing effect that John yes. has. Yes. And I mean, that was very specific. And I mean, Paul recounts that, uh, John wanted to hear the breathing. He wanted it to be very intimate. So George Martin put a special compressor on the voice. Then John dubbed it. I remember John saying to the engineer, when we did Girl, that he, when he draws his breath in, he wants to hear it. Um, we really felt like young professionals. So again, this is part of, <laughs> they, they, they have a sound in their head, they know what they want, and they're starting to use the studio. Um, and then George adds on some overdub guitar, including a fuzz box part that gets mixed out. And then they do the backing vocals. Now, the backing vocals are a bit of a, here's another one of the hilarious uh, rubber soul jokes yes yes <laughs> so it's such a funny album well well you know i would say they were conscious that they now have two songs which are simply sort of la 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 backing vocals you know in, in, yeah. in you won't see me in the Worm man so paul again talks about this and uh, he said we were looking around for another phrase so it was dit 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 which we decided to change in our waggishness that's a good word uh tit tit mm -hmm. tit which is virtually indistinguishable. And it gave us a laugh. It was to get some light relief in the middle of this real big career that we were forging. If we could put in something that was a little bit subversive, we would. George Martin might say, was that dit dit or tit tit? And we were all going, oh no, it's fine. But then we'd get in the car and break down laughing. So it, 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 it's, it is a kind of little subversive uh, thing. And th th this is, I'm trying to think of an earlier time they did this, but um, I, I, you know, Day Tripper has, has that kind of, 
slightly oh, yeah. double would, entendre in it as well. But get little references in. Um, they work on the song from 11 p.m. till 4 a.m. So that's five hours to get Girl in the can. Um, but they're still not finished yet. They basically have 12 and a half songs for Rubber Soul at this point. So they need to figure out what they're doing next. And what happens next is uh, the song that we mentioned way back at the start of part one of this expiration uh, 17 hours ago is Wait. Uh, this track that had been recorded originally in June for the uh, Help album, but had been left off, that gets pulled off the shelf. Um, and they figured that, oh, now it's good enough. And, you know, it's a song that had been written in the Bahamas when they were in the middle of uh, shooting Help. And, uh, you know, it, uh, it basically comes back to life. Yes. Uh, so if you go all the way back again, you know, the temptation at this time is to think that all these songs are written um, about Jane Asher. Uh, but <laughs> Paul certainly does say it was his song. Doesn't remember John, John collaborating too much on it, although he might have. But they were hanging out. Uh, they were shooting in the Bahamas and he was. Paul was hanging out with an actor called Brandon DeWild, which is such a fantastically 60s. Um, Great name. Name. Uh, he was in, he was a child actor originally. He would appear in Shane in 1953 when he was 11. Uh, he was in HUD in 1963 with Paul Newman, and he was kind of just hanging out and part of the drug scene. And he was smoking dynamite weed with the Beatles. And <laughs> um, Paul does say he was a nice guy. This is in many years from now. He was a nice guy who was fascinated by what we did, a sort of brat pack actor. We chatted endlessly, and I seem to remember writing weight in front of him and him being interested to see it being written. So there's like shades of him writing uh, Picasso's last words in, in, in front of uh, Dustin yeah. Hoffman. Brandon DeWild is a kind of slightly tragic figure. He wanted a music career. He was friendly with Graham Parsons uh, for, from The Birds, and um, he recorded some material with Graham Parsons and supposedly he, he recorded, you know, fantastic. He sang harmonies with Graham Parsons. But uh, there is a song uh, that Graham Parsons and Emily Lou Harris co-wrote called In My Hour of Darkness, which is about DeWild, mm. uh, who died in a car crash in 1972. So Graham Parsons, uh, the first verse refers mm. to that crash. Gosh, that's uh, that's an interesting background. I, I think I'd kind of thought Wait was more of a John song, but it's really more of a, yeah. a Paul song. Um, uh, once they dusted off the shelves, George adds some guitar parts uh, on a volume pedal, some more vocal overdubs and a, an extra vocal by McCartney, and then a little bit of percussion, tambourine maracas by uh, John and Ringo uh, and then that song is done um, then they finally go back to I'm Looking Through You to do a little bit of extra work on I'm Looking Through You so they've done most of the work the previous day but uh, they they just add a, um, some extra vocals and hand claps and uh, from McCartney and Lennon and then the session is over at 7am in the morning on the 12th of November 1965 Rubber Soul finally has 14 uh, songs in the can completed by a 13 hour recording session to finish four of those songs that is a lot of stuff it's a lot of stuff and you'll note that paul has to go back one more time to i'm looking through you <laughs> he just can't uh, he just wouldn't let it lie he wouldn't let it lie. um but and after something like that after all that kind of work you definitely need a break so we'll see you after this one end of part one intermission end of intermission Part two. Welcome back. So Rubber Soul has all been recorded. It is on tape. There is still some mixing to be done. And on Monday, the 15th of November, uh, there's mixing sessions, the seventh mixing session in all. Uh, again, the Beatles not involved. Uh, George Martin is. I'm looking through you. You won't see me. Girl, wait the word. Michelle, all of those get uh, mixed because they are the outstanding mixes to be done for the album. And then on Tuesday, the 16th of November, who does the running order for the songs? George Martin. It's it is wild. Yeah, they just record. They walk out the door and say, "You sort out the running order." You know. Um. So uh, you know, I I think if you just spent thirteen hours, uh, and finished up with the fourth run through of uh, "I'm Looking Through You," I think I'd <laughs> I'd be saying, "Just do whatever you like with this. Just get it out. Uh, we we're 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 done. We're done." But yeah, it is it is interesting, and you you suspect that this is probably the last occasion in which. George will wield such control in in the studio, and I think the running order is good, except for that you, you won't see me nowhere, man. A very similar arrangement. 
you do wonder if there, you know, there must have been some kind of casual background conversations where, you know, George Martin, you know, maybe when when they're listening to a playback of Drive My Car, he says, oh, that'd be a good album opener, boys. You know, yeah. uh, you wonder if some of that stuff was percolating through, whether there was a, a e- even if George is having the final say or he's doing the paperwork, um, whether there there's some talk along the line to say, well, that's a good opener. That's a good closer. Uh, oh, yeah, we'll stick the Ringo song at the start of Side B. It, it seems Maybe he was working completely in a vacuum, but it, it seems well, I think, hard to believe. Yeah, I think those are the key points. The opener, side two, and the closer. And as I say, side hmm. two just mirrors help if you open with a Ringo yep. song. Um, you know, don't want to put the Ringo song on side one. That's <laughs> Don't put the Ringo song on side <laughs> one. Um, the, you know, once George has the, George Martin has the sequencing done, he telephones the running order to Abbey Road and they make master discs on the 17th and 19th of uh, November. Um, so on the 19th of November, they have the master discs made in order to take them off to the, the, the factories to actually start printing the records. And again, from 2021 eyes, you know, we're reading that there's a six to 12 month lead time if you're yeah. in the music business right now to get a vinyl record into the shops. You know, some of these late 2021 records, there's lots of competition to get vinyl pressings done, even though, you know, CD is still sells more copies than vinyl, but you're not allowed to mention that. Um, uh, but in the, the, uh, the capacity was such that vinyl was the medium. I know there were some cassettes and reel-to-reels knocking around at the time, but it's all about the vinyl in December 1965. So it's incredible that you can finish an album uh, on the 15th of November. You can do uh, master discs on the 17th and 19th of November and still have the capacity within the system to get it into the shops uh, two weeks later on the 3rd of December. It's a totally different way you, of doing business. You imagine everything stops for the Beatles. You know, this is the big cash. Kai, this is the big uh yes uh, this is the big well, it, it's... christmas <laughs> bonanza well the big stories uh at the time of recording this podcast has been the capacity for adele and abba albums to be pressed and put into the shops yep. for q4 2021 and adele has been the person who has pushed other people out of the way apparently in order to get vinyl made but um and there is a fantastic photo that pops up on my twitter feed pre- semi-regularly of uh ladies in a factory in hayes middlesex in 1965 doing quality control checks on copies of yep. they're surrounded by stacks of rubber sole and people are looking at them checking them out um but that is how business was done back at that time. But there are still some other things about um, this album for Rubber Soul that we need to pull apart. Uh, first of all, the title. Why is it called Rubber Soul, Stephen? Because it could otherwise have been called It Feet Away or It's the Bloody Beatles Again. So those, <laughs> those wouldn't now, have worked. Those wouldn't have worked. This is, this is an interview that um, Paul gave uh, at the beginning of November uh, when he was asked, you know, um, and, what does uh, eight feet away mean? I don't get that joke. No, I didn't get that joke at all. Uh, I don't know what that means yeah. at all. Um, okay. It's, 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 I mean, it, it, it sort of brings to mind that, you know, standing, standing in the shadows of greatness, you know, that, that eight feet away from, I don't know. I, 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 I don't know what okay. he was. It, it's, a, it's an odd title. Maybe it was just being random, as the kids say. They should just have called it Dynamite Weed and been done with it. <laughs> um, but Paul, Paul, Paul is very clear, or sorry, John is very clear that it's a Paul title. So in 1980, he said, that was Paul's title. It was like your blues, I suppose. It's just English souls, just a pun. Um, but again, Paul, uh, many years from now, he said it came from a comment on old blues guy, you know, Paul hanging out with old blues guys, had said of Mick Jagger, oh, I heard some outtakes, uh, and at the front of it, I'm chatting about Mick, I'm saying hi, I'd read an old bloke in the States who said, Mick Jagger, man, well, you know they're good, but it's plastic soul. So that was the germ of the idea. And certainly the first take of I'm Down, you can hear Paul shouting, plastic soul, man, plastic soul. Yes, it's on anthology, you can hear him say plastic soul. So obviously, yeah, that that's an idea that's going through his head. It, it kind of... It's an amusing, it's, it's, a, it's a hilarious pun. It's another one of these joke it's, aspects. It's rubber sole as in the sole of a shoe. 
as well as yes plastic soul so it's it's another the soul joke. of a person and the soul oh, of you're, music well you're dead on the inside you're not getting these jokes here's the thing rubber soul is become so synonymous with the album itself that you kind of overlook the the pun and the joke you know yeah. of it. and it's a bit like the name the beatles in themselves you, on, on the core of it there's an argument to be made that you know the beatles is just a terrible pun it's yes. just a pun on beat music and it's only because you know the music and them is so transcendent that the pun goes away and the Beatles just means the Beatles and Rubber Soul and Revolver is another album title that's a pun and a yeah. joke and you're like come on <laughs> um you know we can we can do better than this can't we you know puns are not the best form of wit um uh, but you know so Rubber Soul I think you kind of forgive its title because it's rubber soul the album yeah. and that's what it makes you think of it doesn't make you think of bad joke no it doesn't it doesn't make you think of plastic soul it doesn't make you think of shoes it just makes you no. think of the beatles album so yeah it's it's yeah. it's a, a, attained a life of its own a status a meaning of its own now here's the other thing i've noticed and maybe i'm the only person in the world who's noticed it but once i share this with everybody i hope it ruins everybody's life um rubber soul has the exact same form and sound as abbey road it's two B's and, uh, you know, an open vowel, uh, you know, two, um, two syllables and one syllable words together. Rubber soul, Abbey Road, they are both the exact same language. There you go. Silence. I don't know where you, where you want me to go with, I don't know where you want me to go with that. This is, you're always doing this. You're always coming up with kind of, you know, odd <laughs> Uh, uh, phrases that it's all uh, connected that you must kind of use <laughs> vials before this or this kind of sound or what, what's what's your point of this rubber soul abbey road i'm just saying that abbey let it road let it be sounds but let it sounds be. very familiar abbey, abbey road, road is familiar rubber because soul. it sounds like rubber soul abbey road rubber soul rubber soul abbey road you gotta have a system Stephen. you know introduce I see, to each oh, other. okay um, okay <laughs> It's been a long, it's been a long, a long three episodes. It's been a long three episodes. Yes. <laughs> this, this, this is not going to ruin anyone it's, else's life. You're safe enough. It's not, it's not like we're doing this back to back or anything. Anyway, um, the cover is the next thing we need to talk about. So we've got the title. Um, there's also the cover. And when we talk about the cover, I, I, I want to talk, bring up this notion that, you know, Rubber Soul is the album where they, you know, suddenly became an albums act. And, you know, they weren't an albums act before that. And back in season one, we talked about Please Please Me. And I think there's an argument to be made to say that they were, you know, an albums act from the start. They wanted yeah. to give value for money. They wanted to, you know, the, the, their albums just happened to be very, very strong. But I, I think part of the reason people talk about Rubber Soul as being the first proper Beatles album is because the title and the cover were pretty much the same internationally that an album came out in December 65 in America called Rubber Soul with that picture and that lettering mm. and an album came out in December 65 in the UK and the rest of the world with that picture and that lettering and it was called Rubber Soul and we'll come on to in a second how they were different albums but they were both very good albums and I think that means that for the first time there was a universal uh, album that everyone could get behind and that gave it a bit of legs and a bit of support for for them getting this notion of being an album's act. Yes, I think I, I think that's uh, that that's true. There's a there's a there's a brand, a, a sort of international brand developing here, mm. and, and and an international approach. Because previously they just handed the tapes over to Capital. Uh, Dave Dexter did his thing, yeah, uh, and uh, then they chopped them up, and they so the singles weren't matching up, the albums weren't matching up, the covers, nothing was nothing was synchronized. Um, so yeah, I think this is this is probably the point at which. Um, that starts to change. And it is the case, I think, that that was the Beatles that said, we don't like what Capital have been doing uh, and we want all the artwork to be the same going forward. Yeah, they sent Brian off to be the the uh, the emissary of this message. And there's a great video on YouTube from Parlogram Auctions who uh, does fantastic Beatles videos and we heartily recommend them. And he has a, a video on, on Rubber Soul. So he does tell this story that there was um, uh, basically, you know, it seems to be that John Lennon saw the cover of the US Help album and wasn't particularly impressed and pressed upon Brian Epstein that actually we want all our uh, album art to be the same all around the world. And in this Partogram Auctions video, he talks about the communications. There are memos that you can read out there between uh, these chaps, Alan Livingstone, Voyle Gilmore and Dave Dexter Jr. of Capitol Records. And Alan Livingstone says, 
you know, um, yeah, the Beatles want all their artwork to be the same, uh, that they want us to use their artwork. And I think that's a good idea. And this guy, Voyle Gilmore says, yeah, and we should release the same album as well as the same yeah. artwork and should be the same. And then Dave Dexter Jr. kind of storms in and says, go to hell. <laughs> if you want. I know what I'm doing. Shut the hell up. I'm marketing the Beatles the way I want to hell with you. And EMI are a bunch of, you know, Englishmen. There are a bunch of Englishmen and we're not going to do 14 track albums and you can suck it. And, you know, Dave Dexter has a completely different idea for Rubber Soul, which we'll come on to in a second. Um, but this is the first time, you know, Rubber Soul is going to be an international album. If you look at 66 in America, there's Yesterday and Today, and there is an international version of Revolver with the same cover. So there is an American Revolver, although that's slightly different and that's a whole other podcast. But um, Dave Dexter Jr. does go along with using the, um, the, uh, the 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 rubber sole artwork, but he is very defensive and uh, about you know the help artwork in general, saying you know it's very dynamic and it looks properly and it advertises the film and we had to mention United Artists and that the help artwork in the US is not bad. I don't think. I I I have to say I think I think they picked the wrong hill to have that fight on with with help because I think mm. the American artwork with sort of the yellow and orange help emblazoned across the 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 bottom and kind of. Uh, uh, design as if it's sort of coming out of the page i think that that that's probably better it's 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 yeah better than uh, the artwork uh, more striking certainly um so i have some sympathy uh because they picked that particular uh, artwork i think if you put the two together I'd, I'd probably favor the american artwork but i think it's it's a very important point um in in sort of getting control uh there's, there's mm -hmm. an interview from 1968, where George Harrison is talking about Apple and, and the reasons for forming, for, for forming Apple. And he said it was all about getting control. So he talks about their entire career from the, from the first sort of three or four years. After that point, they were focused about trying to get control of, of what was happening to them and increasingly. And I think this is an important step. And, uh, you know, Lennon says this in 1970, he said, you know, we took over uh, the cover and everything. So he he recognizes this is the point at which they they no, they they'd had. It's not that they were badly served. I think I think they were fantastically well served by sort of yep. EMI's uh, artwork and, and, and Robert Freeman and all the rest of it. You know, there, I don't think there is a bad album cover. Um, they're all very striking. Uh, um, you know, even that first, I, I know these things become iconic because the band go on to great things. But that first album, looking over the the, the balcony um, in Manchester mm -hmm. Square, that's a fantastic shot. Yeah, it, it, it's funny, again, to think, you know, when they're having this argument towards the end of 65 in Capital about what the cover is and what the track listing should be. And one of the other reasons Capital had shorter albums was because of how publishing was split in America. There was a pro rata per track as opposed to a split pot in the UK. So they, it, it, it was cheaper to have fewer tracks on albums. But um, it's, it's funny to just remember timeline wise that it's only the beginning of the previous year when I Want to Hold Your Hand is number one. So Capital you haven't even hit the second anniversary of dealing with Beatles records by, uh, you know, September, October 1963. But when we look at the cover, the cover is obviously there, there's two component parts. There's the photography and there's the typography. And notably, there is no mention of the name Beatles anywhere on the cover of Rubber Soul, which is pretty revolutionary for the time as well. But there didn't need to be the faces or the branding. Um, uh, the, there's the famous story about the, the photo session and the, 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 the photo being reviewed. The photos are taken in Lennon's house. Yes, so Robert Freeman talks about this, and he he took a photograph, and he said it was becoming very difficult to get the four together for a photo session. It was the last album cover in which I was involved was taken in the garden of John's house, the central point for three of the, for for all three of them. The distorted effect was a reflection of the changing shape of their lives, and that kind of indicates that he 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 was deliberately crafting that. But Paul tells it's a sort of well known story that. Um, they came to choose which of the photographs they would use and he was setting them up and projecting the photographs onto a card, a sort of 12 by 12 card um, and this piece of cardboard slips and the photograph is sort of distorted and they went, yep, that's the one. And uh, so, yeah. they, 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 so again, a completely sort of accidental, uh, fortuitous uh, accident. Yeah, so Paul asks, you know, when the, when the card tilts and the face are all stretched on this little piece of card, you know, can you print it that way? And Bob says, yes. And they're like, let's do it. And 
uh, you know, you could argue it's a little bit trippy, you know, it's a little bit off the times, it's a little bit distorted. So from that point of view, even if the picture is a little bit dark, maybe, but uh, it, it does give a, a sense of, you know, the distorted perception of things. Yeah, it does. And I mean, I think it, it chimes back to this thing that I was saying about, you know, Revolver being a metallic uh, sounding album. Uh, this is this is more organic. It's acoustic guitars. It's a kind of folk rock. And, and there's kind of earthy tones. There's those sort of suede jackets and everything is quite dark. And uh, yeah, I, I, I think it's a very, I, it's, it is a very good cover. I, I, I think it's an excellent uh, cover. And it's certainly, I think, a big step up from Beatles for Sale and, and Help, the UK version. Absolutely, absolutely. It's starting to bring in a little bit of the art into 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 their cover. I'd like to take it a bit more seriously. And the, the other key factor of that cover, of course, is um, the typography, which is uh, done by Charles Front. Yes, Front's font. Uh, Robert Freeman asked uh, uh, Charles Front, you know, uh, to, to, to create artwork. And uh, he designed that lettering. And again, it's a kind of unique thing. And uh, he says, you know, oh, it's not really designed because of drugs or fraud. But it becomes a kind of iconic thing in the flower power posters and all the rest of it. Yes. But um, he actually said, uh, whether the Beatles were into LSD or not, I don't know. But I certainly wasn't. It was all about the name of the album. If you tap into a rubber tree, then you get a sort of globule. So I started thinking of creating a shape that represented that, starting narrow, filling out. And then he says, I was paid 26 guineas and five shillings. Well, good wanted. Lord. That was a bargain. <laughs> uh, and it was it was auctioned at Bonhams uh, for over 10,000 pounds in 2007, um, which is quite funny. There's a there's a great he he says to me it was just another piece I'd done and I'd put away forgotten about it when I took it to Bonhams I went on the underground with it in a carrier bag when I came back I was absolutely clutching it in a case so he kind of just takes <laughs> takes it along and it's interesting 2007 you would think that maybe, maybe to, you know the original artwork for Rubber Soul I would have expected it maybe to sell for more than ten thousand pounds but still I would have thought so too so I think it was a bargain in bargain in sixty five and it was a bargain in two thousand and seven. And uh, do you want to do the fun, the fun fact? Uh, well, yeah, it's, uh, what I was going to say, it is obviously hand drawn because, uh, you know, I've tried in the past to do nothing is real promos where I've inserted yeah. the nothing is real onto the album titles and rubber soul is impossible to do. You try and hand drawn and it's just impossible. But yeah, the fun fact about Charles Front is that his daughter is Rebecca Front, who's a famous UK actress who uh, is perhaps best known for being in the thick of it as uh, the government minister, uh, Nicola Murray. She was also in the day to day back in the day. Uh, she's a very... Uh, talented and uh, funny actor, but she often she is quite a you know a strong presence on Twitter. And her dad is still with us, and she has posted stuff from her dad. And her dad is utterly delighted and amused that people are still excited that he's the man who did the Rubber Soul artwork, which is a very sweet thing if you think about it. And rightly so, uh, rightly so. Um, so we have the artwork, which is the photography and the typography. Um, so let's focus a little bit on the US release because, you know, the, the releases were standardized in the 80s with the release of CD. So the, the 1965 Rubber Soul became the de facto international edition of Rubber Soul. And, you know, the 1987 CDs were, you know, now 34 years ago, a lot more time has passed since then than between the original release of Rubber Soul and the CDs. There was only 22 years between those two things. Um, but the original North American release is a very strong album. So when we come back to Dave Dexter Jr. fighting his corner for what Capital have done to Beatles albums, he has a very strong intent for Rubber Soul in the US being a very different thing. And I think out of all those Capital albums, uh, I think there's a, a, a the strongest case to be made as a standalone artistic statement is possibly the original US Rubber Soul. And even though he kept the title and the cover, there's some slight changes to it. It's a little bit brighter. It's a little bit sharper. It's more gold than that kind of dark brown on the on the logo. But it's the running order where he makes a really significant difference. Yes. So the, the, this the, the album opens with I've just seen a face. Um, mm. And I, again, that song is huge in America, I think, for that reason. And we've talked about this before, about Wings Over America, where Paul is choosing Beatles songs and and he I remember at the time buying that 
that album and listening to it and not really understanding one why Paul had chosen that song. It seemed pretty obscure to me, and two why it was being so well received by the audience. But it's obviously it it, it has a particular resonance, and that's also the song he and Paul Simon perform on Saturday Night Live. Yes, isn't that right? And again, it's it's it it. it it gets a huge response. Yeah, it's it's it, the the North American release of um, uh, Rubber Soul is a twelve track album, and the songs that they have gotten rid of are Nowhere Man, What Goes On, Drive My Car, and If I Needed Someone, which you know pretty strong, three very strong songs plus What Goes On, um, and not only that, but they change the opening track of Side A and Side B. So as you said, Side A opens with I've Just Seen a Face from the Help soundtrack, but that hasn't. To that point been released in the US and side two opens with It's Only Love also held back from the US release of the Help soundtrack. So you're going on a, a running order of I've Just Seen a Face, Norwegian Wood, You Won't See Me, Think for Yourself, The Word Michelle, side one, and side two, It's Only Love, Girl, I'm Looking Through You, In My Life, Wait and Run for Your Life. Uh, and, and Dexter's plan was to, you know, that there was some kind of folk rock boom going on in the US at that time. And he you know, the, the, he wasn't trying to do this randomly. Some of those capital reissues might seem to be a bit random, but he had an intent in doing it this way. Yes. But the one thing I would say is if that was his intention, why was if I needed someone not on there? You know, it's the most overtly birdsy, yeah, that's birdsy true. song. And I thought, well, that 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 would be. But he's going he's he's going almost more for an acoustic uh, folky sound. Um, and, yeah. and, but 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 if I needed someone it would seem to me to be the logical choice, maybe ditch run for your life as a kind of, you know, a weaker song and, and put if I needed someone. But I but I agree. It's a it's a strong statement and um, it's it it creates a very different feeling to the UK yeah. uh, version. Yeah, I mean, roughly looking at the track listing there, the 12 tracks, I would say six of them don't have any electric guitar on them whatsoever. And that's yeah. a, a significant change to previous Beatles albums, you know. Um, uh, also, Dave Dexter was nice to, you know, he was very known for 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 putting a bit of extra reverb, that kind of capital reverb yes. on this. So there, there's some notion that, uh, as audiophiles say, there's some pressings that are kind of wet, Um that there are some pressings that are more desired than others. Is that fair to say? Yes, uh, I, I, I think that's right. I have to say I'm not, you know, a great audiophile. I mean, I, I, I sort of take them for what they're, but I speak as someone that grew up with the 70s stereo fake UK yep. mixes. So those are those, you know, you, you, you like and you, you, you love the albums that you grew up with. So I, I don't, I'm one of those people that doesn't get overly hung up on uh, uh, different pressings and which one sounds lighter or which one is a slightly better mix and well, i know you i know you're fond you, of these things well I'm, I'm sometimes fond of them i'm no expert on them again i will defer to parlogram auctions on youtube who i mentioned earlier on who is very much likes to get into the woods on these things and good for him um, but as you said earlier the other weird and interesting thing about this is that there is no single on it often the Beatles American Capital albums the, the point was that they'd be driven by a single and yep. unlike the UK where the singles were standalone you know singles would drive and then they they put on some other things so he is trying to do something different here it's only 28 minutes 55 seconds long singleless so it's uh, it's an interesting angle singleless and ringoless <laughs> yeah, no Ringo song. No Ringo Poor song. Ringo. You'd be disappointed if you were a Ringo fan in 1965 and lived in America. Uh, maybe, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, here's, <laughs> here's the other interesting thing, which is, uh, you know, when people talk about the influence of Rubber Soul, particularly Brian Wilson, you know, he's listening to this Rubber Soul, isn't he? The, yes. That seems to be the general take. Yes, and I, you know Brian sort of credits uh, Rubber Soul, the, the the American Rubber Soul, as being the impetus for Pet Sounds, and he is sort of saying this is the album that made him realize that you could do more than just gather some songs together. That there's a kind of a, a if not a theme, at least a a sound and a, and, a, and a kind of a a direction, not just a, mm. a random collection. And I think you you know the Beach Boys had almost kind of got there before um, with 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 one of their albums in particular, but but I think this is this is where he kind of thinks right. I I can I need to elevate what we're doing. Um, we we don't need 
uh, to to just record randomly and pull songs together to make up the numbers. And I think certainly the way Capital had been approaching um, the Beatles output up to that point, which was a very short period, as, as you say, but there were a mm. lot of albums that had come out in that very short period. They were just oh, ra yeah. randomly selecting songs, parceling them up and putting them out because they knew they would sell. And there wasn't really the thought. So, I mean, to be fair again to Dave Dexter, I think he's at least, uh, he, he's done a very good job in, in terms of the, uh, the running order. I, I can't imagine Lennon mm. was happy. He, he, it's Only Love is a song he particularly disliked for some reason. I've never really understood that. But Yeah, um, yeah. well, he's wrong. It's a great song. Wrong. Um, uh, obviously, whether you were in the UK or the US or anywhere else, uh, Rubber Soul went to number one. Worth saying that after six weeks at number one in the US, it was knocked off the number one spot by Whipped Cream and Other Delights by Herp Albert's Tijuana Brass, a classic album cover. Do you, uh, have, that, do you, have, that, do you have that album next to your collection of Playboys? <laughs> I, I do not know. In your red velvet smoking jacket. And, uh... <laughs> but we should probably wrap up by pointing out that once the album was coming out, there were still a couple of obligations upon the Beatles, uh, that this is the last gasp, as we said, of that early Beatles, where they're turning up in provincial theatres and yeah. on TV shows and all the rest. And, you know, generally being, you know, larking about for it, uh, you know, the the, the, the other jobs that they have in hand is they they do have some radio recording to do. So they do radio recordings on the 29th of November and the 30th of November, Saturday Club and Pop Profiles. So they're still in the radio session zone. And um, a little bit earlier on November the 23rd, they record promos. So they're kind of getting a bit wise to the game that they can't be everything. They yeah. can't be all places for all people. And so on November the 23rd, they record promos for We Can Work It Out, Day Tripper, Help, Ticket to Ride, and I Feel Fine. So uh, some of their old stuff and some of their new stuff, which they do out in Twickenham Film Studios. I'm telling you, the parallels to get back are just unreal. It's unreal. <laughs> so, so yeah, so this is, this is, this is that, you, you know, this would become, this is really the way, the way forward. And this is, the interesting thing about this is it's uh, NAMS that uh, set this up. Uh, yeah, not know, EMI. Not EMI. Not EMI. And uh, as you say, uh, Tony Bramwell was there and he says at Twickenham we shot up to three versions of each promo and simply sent copies of the best free of charge to every TV station the Beatles had ever been on. But it was too expensive, we were told. When EMI called and complained that we'd spent a total of £750, we fell about laughing. The accounts office said it was far too much. <laughs> you think £750, a uh, lot of money. Jeez, that would buy you three quarters of a George Harrison box set, you know? I can if you hear think what about you're it. saying. I hear what you're saying. <laughs> so, yeah, the, the Beatles, the 10 separate films were made on that day. Each uh, The Beatles kind of acting out a different scenario in each one. So there's like three clips for Day Tripper where they're in their Shea Stadium suits or George and Ringo are behind the railway carriage prop and Ringo starts dismantling the set, you know. Um, you know, Paul and uh, John are kind of in a 90s, 1920s style airplane. Um, there's the... Uh, the, the, the film for help where fake snow lands on the group and they're holding up umbrellas and all the rest. They make their clips for Day Tripper. Again, the, the props are out. And um, oh no, I've already mentioned Day Tripper, so I'll have to edit that out. Pardon me. And there's also a three, two. So there's also the clip where they sit on the floor and eat fish and chips. That's recorded from this day. Probably yes. my favorite Beatles video of all. I think so. But that's the one that Brian Epstein would not let be distributed at the time because it was, you know, I don't know, not seemly, not in keeping with their yes. image. And apparently the names, as well as distributing for free, they were actually sold. The BBC paid 1,750 quid to broadcast some of these on top of the pop. So they certainly were a very profitable enterprise. I mean, in retrospect, it's a genius idea. It is a genius idea. And uh, you wonder why groups today don't make promo films. Oh, they do. Well, it's all about... <laughs> it's all about the lyric video on YouTube these yeah, days, isn't it? You know, and the reaction true. video. Um, the uh, the the final kind of obligation that they have is uh, a tour, and the tour starts on uh, Thursday, uh, December the second in Glasgow, in the Glasgow Odeon, and then the album comes out the following day, the third in the UK and the sixth in the US. And you know what we've talked about throughout these three episodes is just how amazingly quick we hate to drag the 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 fact home but um you know they, their first session is on october the 12th and within the space of uh seven and a half weeks 
they have Rubber Soul in the charts and they're back on the tour playing their last run through US theatre, uh, pardon me, through UK theatres doing their last run of UK gigs until, of course, their appearance in January uh, 1969. Um, and as if, you know, you needed a, a postscript to, to this type of era, on December the 13th, Paul takes LSD. Ta-da. You know, ta-da. Get with the program, granddad. Uh, what does it all mean, Stephen? What does it all mean? Well, we've already opened this all those hours ago when we started recording this. You were saying, you know, you don't, <laughs> you don't rate this album. Uh, I think this is a great album. Uh, I think it's a great album, both in its UK and US iterations. The UK one is obviously the one uh, that, that, that I'm most familiar with. And I, I, it is slightly odd if you put the American version on to suddenly hear I, I've just seen a face. But I think this is a fantastic album. I think it's the, there's a maturity in their songwriting. I'm not saying that there aren't some... I, I would agree with you about Michelle. It's, it's slightly contrived, but I think... That's kind of part of the fun. And you're the you're the fun guy. Yeah. You're the fun guy. You bring the fun <laughs> to this podcast. I would have thought this is yeah, a debatable. I would have thought this is the this is the uh, album for you. But um, this is an album I really do like. Uh, I think it's uh, the start. It ushers in the sort of second half of their career. I wouldn't. I wouldn't. Uh, or the next stage of their career. I wouldn't date that from Revolver or or, or Magical Mystery Tour. I think Rubber Soul um, and. Uh, Certainly things would never be the same again, I think is probably the the, yep. the, 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 the fairest thing to say, you know. Um, you have a quote here from George, which is, uh, Rubber Soul was my favourite album, even at that time. I think that it was the best one we made. We certainly knew we were making a good album. We did spend a bit more time on it and tried new things. But the most important thing about it was that we were suddenly hearing sounds that we weren't able to hear before. Also, we were being more influenced by other people's music and everything was blossoming at that time, including us, because we were still growing. And now, George said that anthology time, roughly in the mid 90s, uh, there's a bit of a, a cheery, I mean, considering it was made so quickly and on the lamb, is that really true that they were spending more time on it? Well, they, they, well, what they're doing is they're experimenting with science. Um, and yeah. from George's point of view, I suppose, he is moving into a kind of more towards the center of the group uh, in that he's writing songs which stand comparison with, with the Lennon and McCartney songs. And I mean, I am Team George, but I would say that his songs do bear comparison uh, with, with Lennon and McCartney songs. He's bringing the sitar in. There's the start of that Indian influence. This really marks the point where George would kind of move more towards that central element. And I, but it was made quickly, but they're spending, uh, they're spending more time on each individual track, you know, yes. and, and, and they're and, working in a different way and they're working across midnight. And it's amazing how quickly that suddenly becomes the norm. Yeah, I think I think, you know, compared to I mean, we're talking kind of Beatles time here where everything's contracted. Yeah. Certainly the the, the 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 era of recording 10 songs in a day, uh, it must seem like a lifetime to record past midnight and re-record a song two or three times. That's yeah. certainly a lot more time in terms of their own uh, universe. It's certainly, you know, as you said, things totally change after Rubber Soul. I think if you were uh, somebody who was going into the record shops uh, on the 3rd of December 1965 to buy Rubber Soul, the other albums that were out that day was the debut from The Who, My Generation, came out on the same day. So imagine picking up those yeah. two albums. And if you're in the US, uh, December's Children and Everybody's by the Rolling Stones was coming out. And on both sides, Turn, Turn, Turn by the Birds, their second album came out as well. So um, it was a good uh, time to be buying music. Well, if you think... If you think of the, that Who album and the production on that, mm. that by, by 1965, by December 1965, that's quite dated. Uh, yeah. The production, yeah. you know, I know they're not doing the same thing and it's essentially a, a, a three piece group with a, with a singer, but it's a very different thing. And, yeah. and the Beatles have yeah. kind of moved past that. Um, and even December's Children and what the Stones were doing, you know, it, it really takes another three years, I think, before the Stones catch up to be doing something comparable the who as well you know so the, the beatles are really i think they they we, we talked in the help episode about them being under pressure from all these other mm. groups that are coming i think this resets their position as the they're, they're in pole position 
Yeah, I think if you look at it like that, you know, the, the, the groups like particularly I'm thinking the Who and the Kinks who kind of uh, kind of emerged in 1965. Yeah, this is them pulling away again, yeah. where perhaps, you know, you could argue help wasn't the grand pulling away that they, they needed to be doing at the time, even though uh, help is still a fantastic record. But it comes back to that old chestnut, folks. What do you think? We want to drive you back to the music as usual. Go listening to Rubber Soul again. Go listen to the US Rubber Soul. Go listen to Help. Go listen to The Who, whatever you want. Uh, Go listen to all three parts of our Rubber Soul podcast uh, all over again. We remain available to discuss all of this in the usual places, the big portal that is nothingisrealpod.com, the website, um, Twitter at BeatlesPod, the Nothing Is Real Facebook group. Uh, thank you to all our ACAST Plus supporters. If you go to nothingisrealpod.com, you can uh, see how you can subscribe to ACAST Plus, get bonus episodes that we've been doing throughout the year, and uh, there'll be more stuff to come as well. And all the usual places where we're happy to, to talk to you all. But for now, my name is Jason Carty. My name's Stephen Cockcroft. And this has been Nothing Is Real, the Rubber Soul Mega Mix. Thanks for listening. One of the things that gets thrown at Abbey Road is the fact that, oh, it's their first proper album. Sorry, sorry. The stop, reason... stop, 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 stop. Okay. You said the first thing about Abbey Road. The thing about Abbey oh Road my gosh. is their first album. You see, you can't, you see, tell, you see? You can't tell the difference between I didn't even notice. Rubber Soul Abbey Road. They're so similar, you can't tell them apart. You're confusing yourself now. Let's edit this. We can stick this on at the end.